It is my great honor to introduce to you my colleague, Dr. Martha Moore Kish, on this happy occasion of her inauguration as the J.B. Green Associate Professor of Theology. We are in the company not only of Dr. Moore Kish and her family, but also Dr. George Straup, the former Green Chair Professor, and his spouse Donna, and Vivian Guthrie, the spouse of Dr. Shirley Guthrie, who occupied the green chair before Dr. Straup. This makes this a significant event for all of us gathered here and for Columbia Seminary. The credentials and the accomplishments of Dr. Morkish are listed in your program. She is a graduate of eminent institutions, Harvard College, Union Presbyterian Seminary, and Emory University. She is the daughter of educators and now is herself an educator. Good job, mom and dad. <laughs> she has published well and is now deep into the weeds on two additional upcoming publications. She has been active in denominational, ecumenical, and interfaith efforts. And she is the joyful mother of Miriam and Fiona and the loyal spouse of Chris. And I have witnessed many times how Chris makes her laugh. I first met Dr. Moore Kish when she worked in the Office of Theology and Worship of the Presbyterian Church USA's headquarters in Louisville. I was so happy at that time to meet another woman reformed theologian. And it has been a particular delight for me to watch Martha grow from strength to strength in her professional life. She is an important theologian of the broad, hospitable, reformed tradition. She has helped to re-energize sacramental theology in the Presbyterian Church. And she is stretching into areas of interfaith and multicultural theology. I am proud to be her colleague, and I present her to you now. So my first words have to be thank you to President Van Dyke, to the board of trustees that is making me sit in this big green chair, <laughs> to Dean Yoder for her sneakiness in officiating over this whole process, and to Jane Gleim for extraordinary gifts of hospitality in this as in all things at our seminary. To all of those long ago donors who uh, contributed to make this chair a part of our institution, and to the members of the Green family who are with us today. To Vivian Guthrie, who is somewhere where I hope she can hear. Vivian, thank you for being here. To George Straup. Where are you? To George Straup, my former co-teacher, still my colleague, previous holder of this chair. Thank you for making room for me for teaching me how to teach theology, for modeling how to do theology that is simultaneously critical and always full of laughter. To all of you for being here, colleagues, family, friends, mentors. I want to start with a couple of stories. The first one is a story that George liked to tell. When we used to teach together, no giving away the punchline. <clears throat> and it's a true story about uh, my first day starting Greek school at Union Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. You see, uh, after college, I had applied for and been accepted to Union Seminary, but had deferred for a year in order to go study ancient Indian history and culture at Vishwabharati University in West Bengal, India. I spent the year traveling widely around the Indian subcontinent, and reading a great deal of medieval 
um, bhakti devotional literature in English translation. I uh, spent the entire year exploring um, Hindu devotion and then uh, returned to the States. And after a few quick weeks of turnaround, I started Greek school in the summer of 1990. The first day we each stood up, uh, the students stood up in class, introduced ourselves, and I stood up and I said, I'm Martha Moore. I just got back from uh, studying for a year in India where I was exploring Hinduism and I thought I would come and give Christianity a try. <laughs> no one laughed. <laughs> Although my husband, who was right in front of me, in the chair right in front of me at the time, says he was laughing inside. <laughs> the rest of my life has been an attempt to figure out what was going on in that moment. Here's another story. A few years later, my first semester uh, of studying theology, theology here at Emory, I was privileged to take the last doctoral seminar of James Gustafson who had been an eminent theologian and ethicist at University of Chicago and spent a few post-retirement years here at Emory. I made an appointment one day to talk to Professor Gustafson about something in theological anthropology, and he asked me a pointed question. He looked at me and he said, what is your question? What is your real question? So I thought for a moment, and I, I said, well, I remember being uh, in the city of Varanasi on the banks of the Ganges when I was studying in India, and I remember going out one morning on the boat. A friend and I had hired a boat to take us out on the Ganges at dawn, and we were watching as the people were washing in the river, and the people who were preparing the bodies for burning on the banks of the river, listening to the chants in the air, watching the sun come up. And at one point, our boat um, pilot, boat driver person, boat, the person who rows the boat, gave, um, <laughs> gave us uh, tiny leaf boats with little candles and flowers in them gave them to us and set them in the water so that they could carry their light down to the sea. The mist on the river, the lap of the waves, this chanting over the burning bodies, the lights on the leaf boats. And I said to Dr. Gustafson, what do those leaf boats mean for me? How do I interpret my own presence as a Christian person, as both an observer of and a somehow a participant in Hindu devotional ritual. It's still my question, all these years later. So today I'm going to ask it this way. How do we follow Jesus the Christ in this religiously plural world? So in our time together today, I'm going to tell you a story about how one family of Christians has wrestled with this question for the past 500 years. And then I'm going to suggest an emerging path, a next chapter in this story called comparative theology. And then I'm going to suggest why I think a reformed theologian in particular might approach comparative work. Now, you might be asking yourselves right now, what is comparative theology? So I'm going to get there at the end of the lecture, but I, I'll just say briefly here, comparative theology is a mode of theological reflection that takes seriously the sources not only from one religious tradition, but from more than one, two, or perhaps more religious traditions. For example, if I were to reflect on the Lord's Supper, let's say, not only using the words of Jesus and Julian of Norwich, and John Calvin, not only my experience of singing hymns and coming to the table, of breaking the bread and receiving the bread for so many years, if I were to think about the Lord's Supper based not only on those Christian sources, but also based on what I have seen and experienced from puja in Hindu temples 
from receiving prasad in those places, that, that would be comparative theology. So that's where we're going. But before we get there, I need to tell you another story. This is a little longer than the first two because it's not just about me and it, and it covers a, about 500 years. <laughs> this is the story of my particular Christian family, the peculiar Christian family known as Presbyterians, who have wrestled in many and various ways all these centuries with how to follow Jesus in a world of religious diversity. The historical material I'm going to be sharing with you in the first part of today comes from a more detailed essay that I wrote recently called Presbyterians, Religious Diversity and Religion. It's for an Oxford reference book coming out. You're going to be glad to know that last week some of my beloved colleagues staged an intervention <laughs> and talked me out of telling you all of the detail. <laughs> Beth Johnson, Christine Yoder, Kim Long, thank you very much. <laughs> you can thank them later. So what you're going to get are, I think, sort of broad strokes. Kathleen O'Connor, where are you? Also. So, so if you're interested in more details, William Yu, um, Mark Douglas, if any of you are interested in more details, you can have the whole essay later with all the footnotes. But you're not going to get it now. So what, what I'm going to do today, first of all, I just want to situate these terms. Both you all in the room know the relationship of these terms. But just for the sake of clarity, um, to locate what I'm talking about in the larger Christian vision, you have this. So Christianity, right? That's the biggest circle here. Within the realm of Christianity, some people are Protestants. Some people are not. But some people are Protestants. Within the Protestant world, some people are Reformed. Now, some people use Protestant and Reformed interchangeably. But I'm, when I use the word Reformed, I'm using it in its narrower sense, which is to say uh, Reformed, not Lutheran, right? Not Anabaptist. These other things that could be called, that are Protestant. Reformed is one family within Protestantism. And then Presbyterians are one way of being Reformed. William Yu, would you affirm that? Or would you draw this differently? We'll talk about it later. So, um, <laughs> right, but, but basically, basically, right, Presbyterians are a subset of Reformed, which is a subset of Protestant, which is a subset of Christian. Okay, so that's what I'm talking about. So, in thinking about how Reformed and Presbyterian Christians have interacted with religious diversity through the ages, I have to begin with a few caveats. First, I am looking particularly at Presbyterian history and theology, not because I think it is the best, or the only way of being Christian, but because we never begin our theological reflection from nowhere. We begin where we are, with our particular histories and convictions. It's better to be honest about these things. I self-identify, for better and for worse, as a Presbyterian and Reformed theologian. It doesn't mean that I'm always proud of everything that Presbyterians do. As I have learned ever more clearly through the years from my colleagues and students, from the churches I visit when I teach and preach, from reading history and headlines, we Presbyterians have a lot to repent of. In this country, Presbyterians have been deeply implicated in the sin of racism. Even as some Presbyterians have fought mightily and continue to fight mightily to dismantle it. With regard to religions, Presbyterians have said some pretty ugly things about people of other cultures and faiths. And we have sometimes thought of ourselves as more civilized, more educated, more sophisticated, and therefore closer to God than other people. Our doctrine of election has not always helped us in this regard. <laughs> sometimes playing into dangerous notions that we are the chosen ones, given privilege because God has ordained it. So as I tell this story, I'm not going to shy away from the problems in our history, but I will acknowledge and learn from them. But of course, problems are not the whole story. One piece of good news about Presbyterians and Reformed folks is that we are never surprised to hear that we are sinners. It's actually something we know pretty well. 
It's why so many Presbyterian churches still have a prayer of confession every week in their worship services. We need to tell the truth about our faults and failings, individually and collectively, in order that we can recognize God's gracious forgiveness and be transformed by it. Sin is radical, and grace in Jesus Christ is even more radical. Presbyterians at our best know this, and it's what keeps us going. Some of you know that I've spent a good chunk of the past 14 years in ecumenical dialogue between Reformed and Roman Catholic churches in this country and internationally. And in these ecumenical dialogues, I've learned an approach that now shapes the way that I try to interact with any dialogue partner. It's called mutual affirmation and admonition. Mutual affirmation and admonition. What that means is that partners in a dialogue come bearing particular gifts. And each partner then works to identify and affirm the gifts in the other before moving on to offer words of admonition, that is, concerns about what might be missing or problematic in the other tradition. So this is the kind of thing that I hope to offer today. A particular gift from a particular tradition, open to admonition as well as affirmation from all the partners in the room. So with all of that in mind, let's begin. Overall, Presbyterians uh, views of religious diversity through the centuries can be summarized in these five ways. Number one, Protestant Christianity alone represents true religion. I'll talk about that first, particularly in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Number two, Christianity is the fulfillment of all human religions, a view that emerged in the 19th century. Number three, all religions have equally valid insights another view that emerged in the 19th century. Fourth, all religions, including Christianity, are problematic. That's a 20th century view. We'll see more about that later. And finally, religious traditions, including Christianity, are simply particular and cannot be generalized. So, the first of those positions is the one that we see strongly articulated in the 16th and 17th centuries. The term religion itself has changed a great deal since the beginning of the Protestant movement. For the very earliest Presbyterians in the 16th century, the term meant basically right worship and right understanding of God. And they used it primarily to emphasize the pure form of Christianity that they sought to embody, contrasted with the superstitious and false religion of the Catholic Church. So for example, you get this quote from the Scots Confession from 1560. The preservation and purification of religion, notice that's the way they're using the term, religion, is particularly the duty of kings, princes, rulers, and magistrates. They are not only appointed for civil government, but also to maintain true religion and to suppress all idolatry and superstition. Such anti-Catholic polemic, I want to suggest, has subtly shaped Presbyterian reflection on religion and religious diversity for centuries. And we do well to watch out for it in any discussion of religion among Presbyterians today. So overall, these early Presbyterians tended to dismiss non-Christians, all non-Christians, along with Catholics, as being outside the realm of God's electing grace. This Protestant emphasis on grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, and Christ alone contributed to a largely negative view of all other religious traditions, especially the false religion of the Catholic Church. Guided by the opening chapters of the Book of Romans, Reformed Protestants emphasized that even though God had revealed truth plainly to all people, all had willfully turned away. Beth Johnson, do you want to recite it here? <laughs> There's no one righteous, no, not one. No, not one. All had turned away, worshiping idols and indulging in immoral behavior. Only the grace of Christ had rescued 
some and enabled them to participate in true religion. Now, despite that generally negative view of religions other than Protestant Christianity, there are two insights worth preserving from the 16th century. First, Reformed and Presbyterian writers affirmed that God's spirit worked in the minds and hearts of people actually outside the church, especially scientists and philosophers. Calvin says, these people enlighten the world in knowledge of the truth. The Holy Spirit then is not just restricted to the church. So that's insight number one. Insight number two, John Calvin declared that those who are chosen by God are part of the invisible church whose boundaries we can't completely know. God alone knows the limits of divine mercy. God alone is the one who saves, not us. So this respect for the work of the Spirit and this reticence to claim more than we can know about God's electing grace, those are insights that I'm going to return to later. The 17th century saw the development of the Westminster Standards in England, which exercised great influence in the development of Presbyterianism. These standards, which included the Westminster Confession of Faith and the larger and shorter catechisms, were, briefly, approved by the English Parliament, and then adopted by the Scottish Kirk, and then traveled to New England and to the Mid-Atlantic colonies. In 1729, in slightly amended form, they were adopted as founding documents of the American Presbyterian Church. And it's relevant for this occasion that um, J Dr. J.B. Green's most famous work was a Harmony of the Westminster Presbyterian Standards in 1951, written at a time when Westminster was still the only confessional standard in the Presbyterian Church in the United States. Westminster's approach to religions other than Protestant Christianity systematized and hardened 16th century views. In general, Westminster insists that true knowledge of God or salvation simply cannot exist apart from explicit faith in Jesus Christ. In the 18th century, continuation of the same theme, but with a slight variation. In the 1700s, most Presbyterians in the world lived in Great Britain and in the American colonies. During this period then, some Presbyterians continued to emphasize the purity of true, reformed Presbyterian religion distinct and better than all other Christian denominations, not to mention non-Christian traditions. Also during this time, American Presbyterians began missions to Native Americans, which prompted the first Presbyterian reflections on the relationship of Christianity to indigenous religious traditions. In general, their view of Native American traditions was not positive. Their judgment of native religious practices as idolatry revealed their assumptions that true religion was not just Christian, but also European and white. But other 18th century Presbyterians took a different line. Some strongly defended religious liberty against the establishment of any particular religion. No establishment of a religion. People should be free to worship as they saw fit, which, at least in theory, made all religions equal under the law. So this democratic spirit of American Presbyterianism sometimes led to recognition that there are shared convictions among different religions. This was usually connected to the idea of natural religion. Here's an example. Samuel Davies, uh, in a 1758 sermon called The Curse of Cowardice, said, interestingly, I don't know what he said about cowardice, but he said this <laughs> about divine providence, interestingly. The doctrine of divine providence is, quote, essential both in natural and revealed religion. An article in the creed of heathens, okay, and Mohammedans, as well as Jews and Christians. Interesting. So here, Mohammedans is an old term for Muslims, revealing the misunderstanding that Muslims followed Muhammad. Uh, but at the same time, recognize that this is 
saying that Muslims and Jews have something in common with Christians, namely a belief in divine providence. So here's a clue that God might be in some way at work among people of other religious communities, even if in practice 18th century Presbyterians were likely to encounter Jews very rarely and Muslims only in books. So here's back to our five approaches. We've talked pr about the first two, right? We've talked about, we've talked about the first one actually. We've talked about the first one, that Christianity alone represents true religion. That was the majority view, 16th, 17th, and 18th century. In the 19th century, you get the emergence of this second view, that Christianity might be the fulfillment, not just the replacement, but somehow the fulfillment of all religions. Evangelical fervor exploded in the United States and Europe in the early 19th century, inspiring missionary movements to bring the gospel to parts of the world where, it was assumed, it had not been preached before. Many Presbyterians embraced these efforts, increasing their awareness of religious diversity of the whole world. Now, early missionaries in the 19th century usually assumed that Protestant Christianity was the only true and saving religion, and that they must proclaim the gospel so that people could recognize and receive the grace of Christ through faith. They had little interest in non-Christian beliefs and practices. The missionary goal was simply conversion, not to discuss the pre-existing religious commitments of those whom the missionaries served. Early 19th century American Presbyterianism was dominated by this view. But as the century progressed, even as some Presbyterians continued to hold that view, some others began to have a different, a more positive view of other religions. This was influenced by the theology of German Friedrich Schleiermacher, who defined religion as the feeling of absolute dependence the feeling, the gefühl of absolute dependence rather than being based on enlightenment reason. Christian religion then focused on our absolute dependence on God made known in Jesus Christ. But the feeling is universal. It's not simply restricted to Christianity. So the, even though Schleiermacher primarily was interested in talking about Christianity, he did recognize that all religions had some valid religious experience. In addition to affirming this universal religious sensibility, many Christians in the second half of the 19th century were strongly influenced by the emergence of an historical and evolutionary interpretation of religion, influenced by the thought of Charles Darwin and Ernst Trelch. Building on this insight, many 19th century religion scholars described a natural evolutionary process of religion as a cultural institution that automatically moves over time from being more primitive to being more sophisticated. So from a kind of animism, a kind of worship of the spirits in nature to a kind of polytheism, eventually to the highest form of religion, which is monotheism, and of course, eventually to Christianity, the most advanced religion. In the 1890s, some scholars and church leaders began to move even beyond this evolutionary view of religion, looking instead for more equal common ground among various religious traditions. This 1893 Parliament of the World's Religions in Chicago is a great example of this emerging attitude toward world religions as equal. The Chicago World's Fair, uh, the World's Fair, excuse me, was held in Chicago that year, and John Henry Barrows, who is the pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Chicago, decided to organize a meeting of all the world religious leaders to go along with the world's fair. So Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, Sikh, and other major religious leaders spoke to large crowds, marking the first time that many American Christians, including Presbyterians, had heard from representatives of these traditions. Barrows hoped that this meeting would inspire people to see all religion 
as a source of greater mutual love and peace, rather than a source of conflict and violence. In the introduction to the published proceedings of this conference, Barrows described religion as the universal positive tendency in all humanity. And he compares it, as you see in this quote, he compares it to a light that has been broken into many colored fragments by the prisms of men. One of the objects of the Parliament of Religions has been to change this many colored radiance back into the light of heavenly truth. Now, not all Presbyterians celebrated this event, <laughs> but some did, and it does mark a significant development in relation to religious diversity. So we can see then in the 19th century both gifts and dangers regarding religious diversity. The evolutionary view of history affirmed common ground and connection among all human religions. It did inspire more mutual respect, but on the other hand, it presented Christianity as the highest form of religion, which tended to go hand in hand with Western imperialism. Here's back to the list again. So the first one, right, Christianity alone represents the true religion, 16th, 17th century, 18th century, that continues. 19th century, you have the emergence of this second view, Christianity as the fulfillment of human religions, that continues. And then in the 20th century, you get the emergence of these next three. So that we live now at a point where all five of these are in play among various Presbyterians and I venture to say various Christians um, in this country and around the world. So, I want to talk about these three, let me go back a second, these last three options that emerge in the 20th century. So I'm going to talk first of all about this one, that all religions have equally valid insights. We saw this actually emerging in 1893 at the World Parliament of Religions, right? That was a public celebration of religious diversity with the bold claim that all religions are refractions of a single divine light in a many-colored radiance, as Barrows said. We see this come to fullest expression, however, in the 1970s in the work of British Presbyterian John Hick who advocated a new, what he called, theocentric interpretation of religious diversity. Hick called for a Copernican revolution of religions, hence the image that you have on the screen there. Bill Brown, that's not just for you. That's actually a depiction of, uh, of the way Hick understood all religions to relate to each other. Not Christianity at the center, but God at the center like the sun, all religions orbiting around that sun. So you can see the idea, right? A Copernican revolution trying to unseat the imperialism of Christianity and put instead God at the center. So in 1973, Hick wrote an important book called God and the Universe of Faiths. Universe, probably an important image there. And this quote comes from there. We have to postulate an ultimate transcendent reality the source and ground of everything that is in itself beyond the scope of human conceptuality, but is variously conceived, therefore variously experienced, and therefore variously responded to in life from within these different religious totalities. This approach, which Hick proposes here, has come to be known as pluralism. This affirmation that behind all the diversity of human religions, we are really all one. In 1982, Alan Race, another theologian, published a book called Christians and Religious Pluralism, which summarized these three basic Christian approaches to religious diversity. And he called them exclusivism, which is Christianity alone is one religion, inclusivism, Christianity is the fulfillment, and pluralism. That's this view. Raise your hand if you've ever heard those terms before. Exclusivism, inclusivism, pluralism. Yeah. So this has become, since 1982, the most common way of entering into the conversation about how Christians relate to religious diversity. 
Notice how it lines up with the first three approaches in my list, and notice that we still have two more to go. Here's the fourth view in the list. All religions, including Christianity, are problematic. Even at the same time as some Reformed and Presbyterian Christians were moving toward greater affirmation of truth in all religions, others were moving toward a sharp critique. A lot of this emerged from the work of Swiss theologian Karl Barth and his sharp critique of human religion early in his church dogmatics. Barth began here, as in all of his theology, with God's work of reconciliation in Jesus Christ. That's the starting point, God's work of reconciliation in Jesus Christ. That means that you cannot appeal to any natural or general revelation outside of what God has done in the person of Jesus Christ. God can only be known in that way, not through any other means. What Christ reveals is this, that God is reconciling all humanity to God's self. Indeed, Bart said, all humanity is elect in Christ. And therefore, we can hope, although we cannot know, we can hope that God's reconciling love embraces even those who have rejected or never known it. But Bart argued that looking for points of contact between Christianity and other religious traditions is the wrong starting point. Human religion is unglaube, unfaith or unbelief. It starts in the wrong place. It starts with human effort rather than starting with what God has done in coming to us. So this is going on in the 20th century. At the same time that this is going on, this kind of critique of religion, other Presbyterians began to critique Christianity for another reason, specifically for its alliance with Western imperialism. The view of Christianity as the superior religion that included and fulfilled all that was good in other religions is particularly problematic. Christianity then began in the 20th century to disentangle itself from the Western power, the Western imperial power. And so Presbyterians, like other Christians, came to realize that too often the proclamation of the gospel had gone hand in hand with Western colonial power, imposing Western cultural values. But here I'm just treading on Dr. Nadella's turf, so I'm going to stop there. As many new nation states began to emerge from colonial rule in the mid 20th century, Christianity sometimes was rejected because it was identified as the religion of the oppressor, the religion of the colonizer. This happened sometimes in India, for example, and still happens now. But in the 1920s, during the Gandhian movement, there were some forcible attempts to convert village Christians back to Hinduism because Christianity was seen to be the religion of the British colonial power. But interestingly, in other places, in other places, people actually adopted Christianity as a religious identity that stood against imperial power. For example, in Japanese-ruled Korea in the 1930s, some Presbyterians refused to follow the Japanese order to worship at Shinto shrines because it violated the first and second commandments. This resistance to Japanese imperial rule aligned Christianity more closely with independent Korean identity. So you can see how Christianity can play both ways. All of these critiques offer an important perspective that I want to carry forward. That is, all Christian, excuse me, all human religions, including Christianity, stand under God's judgment and need to confess their tendencies to get caught up in schemes of power and privilege. No human religion saves itself or saves by itself. What we hope for is that sometimes God might work in and through human religions to redeem and save. Here's the fifth theme that I want to introduce, and just briefly. That is the emphasis on all religious traditions, including Christianity, as radically particular. 
One example of this is the contextual theology, the so-called contextual theology that emerged in the 1960s and 70s um, that paid attention to the way that religions take shape in particular places and times. And therefore, we cannot talk about a pure religion that's not also interwoven with social and political and cultural factors. I've put up there um, the cover of one book by my colleague, John Azuma, um, who's on sabbatical this term, the African Christian and Islam, because he's an example of somebody who's doing exactly this work of contextual theology, particularly in the West African situation. So I'm looking at the time, and I'm going to try to um, speed ahead here. I want to simply highlight quickly two basic attitudes to religion that I've noticed in this survey, one basically celebratory and one basically critical. So you get, for example, in the World Parliament of Religions and in the work of John Hick, this view that religion is basically a positive, universal, unifying human impulse that we need to celebrate. At the same time, you also have sharp critiques of human religion as idolatry, as problematic, as focusing on human effort rather than on God's revelation. I want to say that both of these are important. There's something valuable in the celebration. It enables us to appreciate what is good in one another. But by itself, it's naive. I want to say that there's something useful about critique. It helps us to pay attention to the way that religions do, in fact, get caught up in oppression and uh, idolatry and power schemes. But if all we have is critique, then we have no capacity to see religions as possible mediations of God's grace. So I want to move beyond both of those to the field of comparative theology. This is a field that's emerged basically since the 1990s, and I described it to you briefly before. Here's a quote from Francis Clooney. He's a Jesuit theologian who has spent uh, decades of his life working in this field. And this is basically his description of it. Comparative theology is a manner of learning that takes seriously diversity and tradition, openness and truth, allowing neither to decide the meaning of our religious situation without recourse to the other. So comparative theologians like Clooney and John Tatominal at Union in New York and others typically live in one tradition but work very uh, seriously across religious borders to understand and immerse themselves in the religious traditions of another. Um, a few weeks ago uh, in theology, we actually read an example of this comparative theology. So those of you in the room who were in class will recognize uh, the work of Heidi Hillebrand, who teaches at Bethany College in West Virginia. Um, and this is the title of her essay in the book that's just come out a couple of years ago called Comparing Faithfully Insights for Systematic Theological Reflection. What Heidi does in her essay is to sit with the Christian medieval mystic Hadowich of Brabant and the um, Hindu 16th century mystic Mirabai and learn from both of them about what it means to desire the divine. I'll just leave it there. Um, if you want to hear more, we can talk about it later. Uh, that's just one example uh, of the kind of thing that's going on. But it, it, it illustrates some significant features of comparative work today, uh, moving across these religious borders to learn from the other, then to come back and reflect on what we've learned. In the past few years, I have begun to put my very reformed Presbyterian toe into this comparative theological water, and I find it invigorating. This month, I'm completing work on um, a volume called Karl Barth and Comparative Theologies, which includes essays that set the Swiss Reformed theologian into comparative theological conversation with thinkers, practices, and themes from an array of other religious traditions. This volume, which doesn't have a cover yet, will include an essay by uh, Dr. Tim Hartman entitled Humanity and Destiny, a theological comparison of Karl Barth and African traditional religions. You didn't think it could be done. <laughs> you can talk to him later. 20 years ago, Canadian Reformed theologian Jug Douglas John Hall wrote an essay in honor of Shirley Guthrie, holder of this chair, two before me, um, in which he asked how to confess Christ in a religiously plural context. 
he dismisses the three available options of exclusivism, inclusivism, and pluralism, and says instead that we need to turn to a confessional mode. Simply telling the Christian story without coercion or threat in the presence of those who are part of other faith communities. And this is a quote from that essay. 1998. It disturbs me not at all that these others have their own stories to tell, and that my story, the story of God's little son and his humbling, is one whose veracity and import I can neither prove nor force anyone else to accept. Indeed, it is one whose depth of meaning I must myself continue to ponder and wrestle with. It is, in short, a matter of faith, not sight. So I want to say that comparative theology begins there, and then it keeps on going. I think that this confessional move is the first move, and it's where comparative theology begins, simply telling the story, but then leaning in and listening to the story of the other. So when we enter into comparative theological work, we do not nervously check our faith commitments at the door. We confess them honestly, unapologetically, and then listen. Comparative theology makes the risky assumption that we may learn more about God, the world, and ourselves from deep attention to religious others in all of their interesting, messy, embodied particularity. So why then would a reformed theologian engage in this work? Why would someone who identifies with a tradition known for its confession of faith in God alone, a tradition that has defended true religion against all superstition and idolatry, why would such a theologian approach comparative theology? Not in spite of, but precisely because of my confession of faith in God alone. I'm still giving Christianity a try. And the more I abide in this particular Christian family, the more I am drawn to rather than away from other religious families. So this is the conclusion. This is the reason that at least this self-identified Reformed theologian is venturing into comparative theological waters. It's the Trinity. First, the God made known to the people of Israel and in Jesus Christ is free. God gives laws, but God is not restricted by them. In freedom, God chooses not just to mold us out of dust, but to enter into dust itself and become human with us. Such an affirmation reminds us always that God does not conform to our expectations, does not abide by our boxes, not even our religious ones. We cannot comprehend God, but instead we worship this God in wonder, love, and praise. Because God is free, we should never expect God to show up only where we last saw her. Second, the Holy Spirit works not only within Christian communities, but also beyond them. Here, I have to confess that I'm disagreeing with J.B. Green, who in his work on the Holy Spirit, denied that the Spirit worked directly outside of the Christian church. But I am following a clue offered by John Calvin, who suggested in the 16th century that the Spirit is the sole fountain of truth, so that we should pay attention to truth wherever it comes. I'm also following the work of George Straub, who said this 20 years ago. The recognition that the Spirit of the triune God has been, is now, and will be at work in the world, bringing good news to the oppressed, binding up the brokenhearted, proclaiming <clears throat> liberty to captives and release to prisoners. This means that the spirit is present and at work even among those who do not know the name of Jesus. You said that. Faith in this Holy Spirit empowers us to acknowledge wisdom and life wherever it may be found, which looks to me like an invitation to comparative theology. And finally, Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and goes before us. Even in Lent, I can say this, Mark Douglas. <laughs> Jesus has been raised from the dead, and Jesus' resurrection invites us into the adventure 
of comparative theology. The gospel accounts of Jesus' resurrection testify that this was a strange event. The shock and terror of the first disciples attests to this. They show us that the risen Christ was a stranger before he was a friend. In John 20, Mary weeps outside of the tomb. She turns and she sees a stranger. She thinks he's the gardener. And he asks, Who are you looking for? whom are you looking for? And she asks if he knows where the body is so she can take him away. And the stranger speaks her name, Mary. And she turns again, Rabuni, teacher. And he cautions her, do not hold on to me. She had desired to take away the dead body just moments before, but now she encounters the body alive, but transformed. And it is not for her to hold. So too, on the road to Emmaus. It is the stranger who turns out to be the risen Christ. He interprets the scriptures, he breaks the bread, they recognize him, and then he vanishes. Again, the risen Christ comes in the stranger's guise, and again, he cannot be grasped. The resurrected Christ refuses to be held, not in a tomb, not in the arms of his beloved disciples, not even in our religious systems. He grants Mary a new life of hope and joy. He gives Cleopas and his friend a new vision. Yet he grants this transformation precisely by coming to them as a stranger who eludes their grasp. This strangeness at the heart of the gospel calls us to attention to all strangers we encounter because they might turn out to speak the words of Jesus perhaps even the one who gives us leaf boats in Varanasi, or the one who sits across the room from us in Greek school. In a world of religious diversity, our proclamation, Christ is risen, does not turn us away from those who do not share our witness, precisely the opposite. Resurrection turns us toward others, including religious others. Just at the point of our most peculiar, our most particular confession, we find an opening to the incomprehensible mystery of our God. He goes before us, the stranger, and because he carries our life in his, we are drawn with him to encounter the freedom, the mystery, the otherness of God in the faces of all the strangers we meet. Thanks be to God. (laughs) 